From a two-door coupe to a four-door station wagon, a 327 small block to the glorious 454 big block. This juiced up beast rumbled down the quarter mile and left the competition rushing out to build a car that could beat it. And if Chevy had never made it, Ricky Bobby would have never got his courage back. I'm going fast again! <laughs> this is everything you need to know to get up to speed on my first favorite car, the Chevy Chevelle. Before I get into the story of the Chevelle, I have a huge announcement to make. This is a big day for us at Donut. Thank you all for being here. I know a lot of you probably have stuff to do, so I'll get right into it. I'm stoked to announce that Up to Speed has officially partnered with NOS Energy Drink. Thank you, thank you. There's a lot of good energy in this room right now and in my body. NOS Energy Drink gives me that good energy that has my body and my mind feeling great. Now, NOS Energy Drink and Donut have a lot of cool stuff coming up, so I guess look out for that. Now, no more questions. We got some work to do. You ready for this, James? I was born ready for this, Chris. In the 60s, Chevy was a rolling in dollar bills. GM made roughly 53% of all new cars sold in North America, which accounted for more cars than all other automakers combined. Uh, let's just say business was good, but with great business comes great jealousy. GM's competitors like Ford, AMC, and Chrysler were super jelly of all their sales success, and they didn't like that GM was creating a potential monopoly. They wanted Big Brother to step in and do something about it. So GM, nervous about the possibility of an antitrust suit being filed against them, decided that if they really stuck to their self-imposed racing ban from 19 57, it would keep the government off of their backs. So while the other big three brands bailed on the anti-racing agreement they'd all made and headed back to the track, GM was stuck on the sidelines just to watch it. Hey boss, uh, don't you know we're uh, done supporting race teams, right? Oh, you know it, don't you know? Hey, um, also, uh, let's uh, make sure we still develop performance-based cars with big horsepower, don't you know, for uh, the street? Oh, good thinking, boss. That's why uh, you're the boss, don't you know? On the surface, GM wanted to appear as if they weren't a brand focused on dangerous motorsport racing, but it was simply a charade. And in 1963, only a year after GM made the anti-racing policy mandatory, a car that would change the market forever was released, the Pontiac GTO. The beginning of the muscle car golden age was upon us. Taking big V8s and throwing them into mid-sized chassis was the formula for success. Not only were they the cat's meow on the drag strip, they were the lion's roar on the sales floor. <laughs> Oh, hey boss, uh, aren't we trying to not sell so many cars, don't you know? Yeah, don't you know? Well, Pontiac sold over 32,000 GTOs in the first year, don't you know? What? Yeah, but we're not racing, right? Nope, nope, still not racing. Phew, scare me there for a second, don't you know? Not racing is very important to us, don't you know? So while the boys over at Pontiac were partying it up with the success of the new GTO, their Chevy brothers were left looking, pardon my French, like a bunch of chumps. See, back in the day, brands within the main corporate division would battle each other. Just because Chevy was the main squeeze for GM didn't mean that they would be the first to release the best stuff that the GM brand had to offer. So Chevy, Pontiac, and Oldsmobile are all vying for Papa GM's attention. And in 1964, Chevy responded to the GTO with the Chevelle. Good old Bucky Nutson introduced the Chevelle as the car to fill the gap between the smaller Chevy 2 and their larger full-size models like the Impala. Unlike the GTO, which was really just a Pontiac Tempest with a GTO options package, the Chevelle was its own unique model. Suck it, Pontiac! Chevelles came in two series, the 300, which is named after that Spartan movie, and the fancy Malibu, named after the exotic city of Malibu, California. What are your favorite cars that are named after city? Dodge Durango? 
Kia Rio, Datsun Boca Raton. The Chevelle came in a ton of body options, from a two-door coupe to a four-door sedan to a two-door wagon. But the trim package that brought the Chevelle to the muscle car game was the Super Sport package. The SS package got you front bucket seats wrapped in vinyl, full gauges, radio pattern wheel covers, and of course, SS emblems on the door panels and the glove box. The SS option was only available on the Malibu and came with a few engine options. But we're here to talk about big beefy muscle. So I'm only gonna speak about the V8s. Starting with the small block 283 cubic inch four barrel V8 making 220 horsepower. You wanna get a little beefier? How about a 327 cubic incher making either 250 horsepower or 300 horsepower? Why would you get the 250 hertz per version? I don't know. Maybe you like low power, baby. No, come on. We're not gonna put that on a shirt. A year later, in 1965, Chevy gave the 327 the regular production option L79 and juiced it up to make a more power, baby! 350 to be exact. Yeah! More power, baby! For all you non-Chevy buff boys out there, a quick heads up. Chevy likes to use a lot of L's and Z's plus numbers to distinguish engine models and options packages. It can get pretty confusing pretty quickly. Moving on, the rarest of the 65 Chevelles was the Z16, made possible by Chevy executives. They wanted a high profile car to showcase their new Mark IV engine, the L37 big block 396 turbojet V8. Fitted with hydraulic lifters instead of the solid lift lifters used in the Corvette, the motor got a forged crankshaft and pistons, four bolt mains, ported cylinder heads, and an aluminum intake with a holly four barrel carb that produced a very peppy 375 All that power was put through a Muncie four speed which sent power to the rear wheels through a 12 bolt differential. Regular models had 10 bolt dips, a 12 bolt rear end, it can handle more power baby! And apparently there's one convertible Z16 built specifically for bunky nuts, in, but it is lost apparently. In 1966, the Chevelle got a complete restyle. It now had a Coke bottle body shape and a new grille that wrapped around the sides and unique taillights. The Malibu SS name was dropped. Now it was just the SS396. The SS396 got three power options. The L35 Baby Bear, which got 325 hertz pers. The L34 Tween Bear got 360 hertz pers. And the L78 Buff Bear put out 370, go back. And the L78 Buff Bear got 375 hertz pers. I'm giving a lot of attention to the performance-based Chevelles, but let's not forget that in 1966 and 1967, Chevy sold over 850,000 Chevelles. That's bananas. The all new second gen Chevelles came rolling off the assembly line for 1968. The wheelbase was shortened, the hood was lengthened, and the fenders got tapered like my jeans. The new Chevelle look was an instant hit. It looked tough. <laughs> You want a 250 cubic inch, 155 horsepower, six cylinder in a two seater four door wagon? Or do you wanna go full bore and get the SS 396 in a two door sedan pickup? Oh, the Chevelle was a pickup? You betcha, because the El Camino was actually a Chevelle. <laughs> Woo! By 69, the Chevelle and Camaro boys wanted the best GM had to offer, but at the time, GM had a long-standing policy that only their full-size cars and the Corvette could have engines over 400 cubic inches. They didn't want their showpiece vet to be outshone by the Chevelle. Well, that's good for Mr. Rich Pants over here that stunk for Chevelle lovers. And here's where Don Yanko showed up. Don Yanko is known for a few things. The first is finding a way to sell spiced up Chevys like the Nova, Camaro, and Chevelle using sneaky boy tactics. And the second is having the haircut of an angel. GM had a program called COPO, the Central Office Production Order System. That was created so that cop cars with heavy duty suspensions and taxi cabs with stain proof interiors could be ordered. But certain dealers with the right connections, such as Yanko Chevrolet in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania, the city of sweatpants, figured out that cars like the Camaro and Chevelle could also be ordered using the COPO system. 
The Copa Chevelles might be the ultimate sleepers. None of the 323 cars built had the SS badging. They were just base coupes with a custom options package. And while the Chevelle was never equipped with the ZL1, it got the next best thing. The L72 427 cubic inch V8. It squeezed out 425 horsepower by means of a solid lifter camshaft, cast iron heads, and an aluminum intake manifold with a big old Holly carburetor. Inside the cabin, you could operate the beast with Chevelle's strongest regular four speed, the Rock Crusher. <laughs> They ran low 13s in the quarter mile, over a second faster than their SS396 bros. Oh, that reminds me, we're coming out with a whole bunch of new shows in the next couple months to make sure you don't miss any of them. Go ahead, take a little second to yourself and hit that subscribe button. When GM finally relaxed its ridiculous rule of not putting engines larger than 400 cubic inches in their mid-sized cars, it set off a muscle car war. Oldsmobile put the 455 into the 442. The Pontiac GTO also got a 455, and so did the Buick GSX. But the most popular of the bunch was the Chevelle LS6 454. That's 7.4 liters for you trying to convert cubic inches to liters. The 454 SS came in two options, the base LS5, which got a hydraulic cam and a horsepower rating of 360 ponies, or the optional Mac Daddy LS6 with 450 horsepower and a 500 pound feet of turf. If you wanted even more performance, for your 454, you could order the optional ZL2 cal induction hood, a rear facing scoop with a vacuum actuated flap. That's tech, baby. It was the drag strip king, and in 1970, the only other car that could touch the Chevelle in the mid sized muscle car game was the Roadrunner with its 426 Hemi. <laughs> By 1971, the government put in place emission standards that forced a switch to low lead fuel. And when you remove lead from fuel, you can't run as high of a compression ratio. So while the Chevelle engines of the 70s looked the same, they changed on the inside. The only 454 option was the LS5. Chevy said they would bring back the LS6, but they never did. Keep promises. If you overpromise and underdeliver, the only one you're hurting is everyone. 1972 was the last year of the second gen Chevelle. Government emission standards had begun to take their toll on the car. The LS5 454's rating was 270 horsepower, with the Turbojet 400 now making 240 net horsepower. Chevrolet wants your new Chevelle to be the best car you ever own. Chevy built nearly 300,000 SS 396 and 454 SS Chevelles from 68 to 72. No other muscle car ever had a higher volume volume four year run. But with insurance costs rising for fast cars and the rising price of gasoline, the muscle car movement was coming to an end. It's a really sad story if you think about it. The third gen Chevelles came out in 73. Due to proposed federal standards, they installed five mile per hour rear bumpers, discontinued convertible and four door hardtop models. And the front ends now featured new Mercedes inspired chrome grills made of die cast steel. Motor options also suffered. The LS5 got a reduced compression ratio. You know what happens when you do that? You lose horsepower. This was the last year of the SS as well, but it was simply an appearance package at this point. Third gen Chevelles don't get nearly as much love as the earlier models, but the car did make a name for itself in the NASCAR scene. The highest trim level of the Chevelle, the Laguna, was piloted by Benny Parsons in 1973 to win the Winston Cup Grand National Championship. Cale Yarborough won 34 races in 76 and 77 and would go on to earn the first two of three consecutive Grand National Championships in the Chevelle Laguna. Though they obviously weren't the same cars being sold to the public, they still proved to be good on the track. But even NASCAR success couldn't save them. And in 1977, Chevy put the kibosh on Chevelle production, ending an era of one of the sweetest cars to come off the GM assembly line. <laughs> I love you. I love you!